Welcome to the Sunday morning worship service of Christ Presbyterian Church in Hampton Cove, Alabama, where we proclaim Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Join us as we worship together and listen with your heart as teaching elder Mike Calvert brings us today's message from God's Holy Word. Let's open God's Word to our text for the morning, which is 1 Peter 1, and I'll read in a moment verses 17 through 19. As you know by now, this uh, summer we're studying what we've called the gracious commands of the gospel. And these gracious commands are Christian duties and obligations that flow from our eternal redemption by God's grace in our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, the experience of saving grace leads to a life of obedience. A joyful, gratitude-fostered obedience obedience to the commands of our new king until he returns in glory and in victory. And we've looked at these commands from just one author of the, Old, or the New Testament. We're looking at them as they come to us through the pen and the heart of the Apostle Peter. There are a multitude of such gracious commands all throughout the New Testament. And we're limiting our study to the ones we find in the letters of Peter. And so, for our command today, we come to chapter 1 of 1 Peter, verse 17. Now, let me read this for you. And by now, you have your Bibles open, and you're ready to follow along as we read God's Word together. And if you call on Him as Father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Well, I'm sure by now, as you've read this text, perhaps you read it over the weekend, you know what the command is. It's there very clearly in verse 17. Conduct yourselves with fear. And that is the subject at hand. And we're going to focus this morning particularly on the word fear. Conduct yourselves with fear. And let me tell you the main point as we get started. It is clear from the words of the Apostle Peter that believers in Christ, those who've been redeemed by Christ, must display in their lives right now fear. Fear of the Lord. And you'll notice the clever way that the Apostle Peter speaks of our present life during the time of your exile. So right now, it is God's will for God's people who belong to the church of the Savior that they and we conduct our lives in fear. In fear. Now, let me give you four angles that we're going to approach this command from. First, we're going to look at fear and its biblical yet paradoxical nature. Secondly, we're going to look at fear and our Heavenly Father, who is the judge of all people. Third, we're going to consider fear in our present life of exile and what that means. Fear now in the present life of exile. And then finally, fear and the motive and method for maintaining that fear until Jesus comes. And I promise to have all that done by 1 p.m. today. If you listen fast, I'll preach fast, all right? Well, let's consider first fear and its biblical yet paradoxical nature. Now, this word fear is a word you know. Uh, not only you know the English word, but you actually know the Greek word. You know the word the Apostle Peter used here. If you pulled out your Greek New Testament, you would find the word phobos. Phobos, and of course, that word comes to us into the English language without translation, and it is the word phobia. Phobia. That's the word that Peter is using. And uh, there are probably some, some rather confused thoughts in your mind now, because it sounds like uh, the Lord, through the Apostle Peter, is commanding the church to be full of people who have a phobia or phobias, right? And that is the literal word he uses. Now, that can't be correct, can it? And, and I really don't need to prove that to you, but there, there, are, there are many, many such fears or phobias that are absolutely evil and destructive, and they produce anxiety and worry. Some of us have fear of high places. 
Some of us have the fear of crowds. Some of us have the fear of being enclosed in small spaces and things like that. And remember what Jesus said. He kept saying, fear not. Fear not. Don't be anxious, he says in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, don't have the kind of phobias that produce paralyzing anxiety and debilitating fear. Those are phobias we need to get rid of, and sometimes we can on this side of heaven, and there are some fears we'll take all the way to the gates of glory, and they will be finally remedied in the new Jerusalem. But when the Apostle Peter uses the word fear or phobia, he is not talking about what we commonly think of as those negative phobias. In fact, the word phobia or fear in the 27 books of the New Testament appears some 47 times. 47 times. I want to give you some renderings of this word in its context, and you'll see what Peter really is driving at. Now, you don't have time to look at these verses, so just listen, and I'll give you the reference. And we're looking at the word fear in another sense that is used in the New Testament. For example, in Matthew 10, 28, and this may be the text of all texts, Jesus says, don't fear those who kill the body and can't kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. So don't fear men, but fear God. There's the word, phobia, fear. Again, in Matthew, in chapter 14, verse 26, the disciples saw Jesus walking on the water. Uh, one of at least two encounters they had with Christ on the Sea of Galilee. And when Jesus was walking on the water, Matthew says the disciples were frightened and they cried out for fear. And I would submit to you, that's not bad. That's good. They cried out with another kind of fear. An example of that would be Mark 4, 41, another episode where Christ is on the water with the men. And this is the time he was asleep in the, uh, in the boat and uh, the storm came and they woke him up. And the, the disciples uh, are then uh, witnesses to Christ coming out and the, and the sea drops flat and the wind stops blowing. And uh, Mark says the disciples were filled with great fear. And they said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him. And I would submit to you, that's a good fear. And that's the kind of fear that Peter is talking about. And then in Luke 5, 26, Jesus heals a paralyzed man. And this is that amazing story where the man's friends drag him to Jesus. They cut a hole in the roof and they lower him down with ropes right into the lap of Jesus. And Jesus healed him. And Luke says, the onlookers who witnessed that miraculous healing were filled with fear. And that's a good thing. They were filled with fear. Acts 9.31. And here we have now it applied to the whole church. Luke tells us that the early Christian believers in Judea and in Galilee and in Samaria conducted their lives in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Now we learn a lot in that one verse. The church was characterized as those who had confessed Christ as Lord, received baptism, and they lived in the fear of the Lord while being comforted by the Holy Spirit. And those things are not opposed. The comfort of the Spirit and the fear of the Lord. And that's what Peter's talking about. You see, it's a different kind of phobia that the church should have. And finally, on a negative, on a negative note, in Romans 3.18, which actually is a quotation uh, by Paul of Psalm 36. In Romans 3.18, the Apostle Paul says a lack of fear before God is perhaps the evidence of pagan depravity. The lost have no fear of God before their eyes. And the point is they should have a fear of God, a healthy fear of God, the kind that Peter is describing here. So not all fears are bad. That's the paradox. Not all fears are bad. Some are necessary. And the one Peter is talking about is absolutely necessary. Now, let, let's drill down a bit and, and, and do a little etymology. You know what that is? That's like digging around in the meaning of the words. Let's go dig deeper in this word fear. 
Uh, one of the greatest uh, Greek scholars of all time is the late Dr. William Barclay, who was professor of, of uh, Bible at the University of Glasgow. And he has a wonderful little book called New Testament Words. And this is one of the words he believes is a prime word in the New Testament. He says, at a secular level, this word fear is awe or reverence. And it is awe or reverence in the presence of some exalted ruler or some dignitary or some divinity or some God. And the key takeaway point is, in the days of Peter, this word fear signaled reverence and awe. Now, come to the New Testament uses, and Dr. Barclay says that fear is the essential reverence of a man or woman in the presence of God. It is what we feel in the presence of God. He continues, it is a feeling of someone who is living in the shadow of eternity, who is always conscious of God and never forgets that he will give an account to God for the things he's done. That's the reverential fear. And then he makes another point that I, I wish I had time to develop further, and I'll just mention it. But he says, in the New Testament, this word fear, as it's used by Peter and exemplified a number of times in the 27 books, exercises an antiseptic influence on God's people. And I'll say that again, the fear of God, of which Peter speaks and which he commands us to have, should exercise an antiseptic influence. It should purify our lives. It should lead to greater devotion to the Lord. It should lead to a pure love, a sharper awareness of our sins, and a readiness to repent. Now all of that, all of that is what Peter has in mind. Not all fears are equal. We should not fear men. We should not fear the devil and his evil host. And there are many other unhealthy, exaggerated fears that have no place in the Christian life. But there is a fear that is essential and that is the fear of God. In fact, any supposed Christian, any professing believer who has no fear of the Lord should question gravely the veracity and the authenticity of their claim to know Jesus. We must, we must have the fear of the Lord, this reverential awe of God. Now, let's now consider our second angle. Fear and our Heavenly Father who is judged. Look again with me at verse 17. We're to have this reverential fear, as Peter says, for our Father. Look at that word Father. And especially in light of the fact that He is the one and the only one who judges all people impartially according to each one's deeds. Now that's a mouthful. And we need to take appropriate time to understand what Peter is saying here. There is perhaps trouble brewing with this idea that we fear our Father, and in fact our Father is going to judge everybody according to their deeds. Now maybe that has just scrambled your eggs in your brain. And you're wondering, how does that work with salvation and justification? Well, you came to the right place. Here we are. We're going to try to unravel that right now. Let's take the easy part first. Father. Look at that beautiful word, Father. Now, it's only natural that we should call God Father because back in verse 14, believers are identified as obedient children. That's who we are. The work of grace in saving us has turned us into obedient children. That's who we are. We, according to the way the book begins in chapter 1, verse 3, were foreknown by the Father, elect by the Father. We were redeemed by the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And we can cry out, Abba, Father, because we've been saved by grace. That's the miracle of salvation. But then in verse 17, look at these words. If you call on Him, that is, God as Father, if you call on Him. And here is an interesting reference, and there's a grammatical point that I want to make that's unseen in the English translations. But notice, when Peter says in verse 17, if you call on Him as Father. Now, that little word if in English uh, can be tricky. Uh, in the New Testament language, 
the better rendering would be since. Since you call on Him as Father. So Peter is assuming that Christians call on God as Father. And yet there is to be this fear when we think of our Father. Now, I want you to to think with me. There is an episode in the life of Jesus that Peter is clearly alluding to. Think about the word Father, and think about the words call on, which mean prayer. How did Jesus teach us to pray? It is, it is, I think, without doubt that Peter is thinking about the Sermon on the Mount, and he's thinking about how we pray to our Father, our Father. That's how we're taught to pray. And when we begin prayer, those are the first two words that should flow from our mouths, our Father. Now, think with me about the beauty of this word Father. When you think of Father, and God is your Father, you should first think of His closeness to you and to me, those who belong to Jesus. God, our Father, He is close to us. He is intimate with us. He knows us. We know Him. He dearly loves us. We have the closest intimacy with Him than we can imagine. In fact, closer than we can imagine. He has come to us. We didn't go to Him. He came to us. When He saved you, He became your Father. He is closer than your earthly Father by an infinite measure. He is close to us. And again, To quote Paul, we cry out now, Abba, (laughs) Abba, which is a term of deep endearment. Father, Abba. But notice the next words in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, and what are those next words? Who art in heaven. And if the word Father shows us the closeness and the proximity of God to us, His His love for us that started in eternity and will never fail. And His intimate knowledge of us. If if Father means that, then in heaven shows He is yet transcendent. He is close or imminent. And yet He remains in heaven as the transcendent, unapproachable, unimaginable, exalted God who is holy holy, holy. And we have to keep both of those descriptions of God in mind. He is our Father, and yet He is the Holy One, and He is the One who will judge all men and women by the standard of His own holiness. He is my Father, but He is a Sovereign One. And so someone then has backed up Uh, and gotten a running start and defined the fear that Peter is talking about as the appropriate response of the Christian to the holiness of God their Father. It is the appropriate response of the Christian to their holy God and Father. And so the command, as we begin to understand the command Peter is laying out for us, is that we should never allow our sweet familiarity with our Father to degrade His holiness. We cannot approach the Lord with disrespect or inappropriate casualness. That's what he's talking about. The fear of the Lord. The the, the fact is, our Father is the judge and he doesn't lay down his judgeship to become the father to become my father he doesn't lay down his law and forget it he 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 is never amused by sin or my sin or your sin he's he's never amused by disobedience or rebellion or transgression of any size he hates sin as my father and he hates the sin in my life as the father It doesn't please him. And every human being, as Peter says here, reaching all the way back to Adam and spanning forward to this very moment in time, every human being will stand before God, our Father, and give account for their deeds. We know what the epistle to the Hebrews says. So bluntly, you know it. You've got it memorized. Hebrews 9, 27. It is appointed for man to die once. And after that, comes judgment. Now, 
Here's where we have to unravel this seemingly twisted cord about God judging the deeds of every person. And we know that's true. And our fear of the Lord and our deeds. How does that fit together? How does that play in with the doctrine that we love so much, the doctrine of justification? Well, let's, let's see if we can unwind this paradox. That God will judge all of humanity according to each one's deeds must be understood in the light of redemption. We have to start there. We know that every person will stand before God and be judged. And according to Peter and many other places we could turn to this morning, the laser beam focus of the judgment will be on deeds. Our deeds. Our deeds. And here's the reason. And I owe this insight to someone a lot bigger and smarter than me. His name is Martin Luther. You ever heard of him? And Luther helped us with this. He said that these deeds that will be judged are the proof of either the presence or the absence of saving faith. Now let me explain what I think Luther is saying here and what I think Peter is saying. The Bible over and over again says that the judgment will be by works. It will be by works. And, of course, the works are then measured by the holiness and the perfection of God. God requires perfect works for salvation. And thus, that is the measure of the judgment. On Judgment Day, the penetrating grace of God Almighty will probe the inner recesses of every person who has ever lived. And the standard that will be applied to them is the holiness of God Himself. For those who do not have Christ as their Lord, the Father, when He looks at them, will see only evil works flowing from an evil, unbelieving heart, devoid of all fear and reverence for Him. And the outcome, according to Jesus, will be the eternal fires of hell. The lost, those with no fear of God, who do not know the Savior, can only present their deeds of evil. Even the most noble things they may do are accounted as evil because they do not flow from faith in Christ. They were not moved and propelled by the work of the Spirit. They are just the best a man can do. And the best a man can do is to earn the eternity of hell. But what about those who know Christ? What about you and me at Judgment Day and how this fear should play in? What will God see on Judgment Day when you were called to stand before Him? Now let me prime the pump. I'm about to give you some really good news. And so if you're asleep, you want to wake up right here. And uh, if you get a a Southern Baptist uh, charge in you, you can say amen at the end of this when I get through with it, okay? Here's some good news for you. What's going to happen? What's going to happen to you on Judgment Day? We will stand before God. Our name will be called. And our God, who is the judge, will look down at you and me, and He will see deeds. He will see the deeds of His Son. He will see the work of Christ that has become ours by grace through faith. My my deeds as a Christian and your deeds as Christians could never merit heaven. And yet on that day they will be accepted and declared to be perfect for the sake of Christ. He will look at my pitiful service and my my deeds, the work I've done, even as a sanctified man, he He will look at my deeds that are far, far from perfect, that could never merit heaven, and He will see them through the lens of the work of Christ. And He will welcome me into His kingdom. In fact, far from dreading that day, Christians look forward to that day. We look forward to the coming of Christ. We pray it would be today. When I serve the Lord and you serve the Lord as the Spirit moves us, even though it's flawed and imperfect, He receives that as a good work because He looks at it through Christ. And that's what justification gives us. He sees us through the lens 
of His Son. We are in Christ. And my deeds and your deeds are accredited to Christ, or His deeds are accredited to us as if they were the deeds of the Son of God and therefore fully accepted by the Father. So we don't, we don't have a fear of judgment. We have awe and reverence for the judge. See the difference? You have no fear on Judgment Day. There, there's no reason a Christian should dread the coming of Christ. You should long for it. You should long to hear your name called. And when your name is called, the Lord Jesus is going to move you out of the way and He's going to say, I'm answering for Him. He's going to call my name and say, Mike, get out of the way. I'm going to answer for you. Now that's worth saying amen for. That's the Gospel. That is caused by grace. You see that? So I don't fear the judgment, but I fear the judge who is my father. There's a reverence for the judge. Now, let's move to this third angle, and maybe it will become even more clear. The, the fear we're to have in our present life. And let's see how this works out. You'll see that the fear we are to have is the fear uh, not of a cowering person, a person who is uncertain about what's going to happen, but a, a fear of reverence and awe. Think about, if you will, human fathers and human lords and judges for a moment. Men are fickle. Human lords and human fathers are big-time sinners. Have you, have you ever noticed that? You probably have. Human lords and human fathers are unpredictable and they lose control of themselves sometimes, right? You ever blown your stack as a dad or a mom? Sometimes human lords and human fathers and parents are, 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 are unjust. They are biased. They play favorites. And if you had a brother or a sister, you probably figured that out pretty quick. You could play the game of favorites with your parents. Human lords and judges and parents are ignorant of the facts and they don't have the required omniscience to render perfectly flawless verdicts. They goof up. Sometimes, even in the world of jurisprudence, sometimes criminals go free. Sometimes the innocent are sent away. Sometimes human judges accept bribes and have agendas and turn their eyes away from justice and truth. But not our Father. Our Father, He is the first Father, is also the first the Judge. He is the original Father. He is the original Lord, Judge, and King. And what I owe Him in this life is an appropriate and necessary fear that recognizes His majestic glory and perfection. I'm not fear of praying one day and the Lord, and I say this with due reverence, that the Lord is in a bad mood or He's angry at me or He's going to be different tomorrow than He is today. That, that's how we live with human judges. We, you know, it just depends on which judge you get, whether it's going to be 10 years or 100 years, right? But not with God because He's our Father. We know exactly who he is. But I need in my daily life, which Peter says is the time of our exile, I need that fear of my father who is the judge. Look at this word exiles. We've seen that before. In chapter 1, verse 1, Peter defines the audience as elect exiles of the dispersion. And so he's writing to a bunch of small Christian house churches all throughout Asia Minor who got there because of persecution in the great dispersion, so it was known. They literally left their homes and belongings. They had nothing. And they were living in a world now in which they did not believe. They came to Christ in faith and repentance and became citizens of heaven. Their names were etched indelibly into the citizen registry of the kingdom of God. And their true home, their true city, their true citizenship, their true kingdom is the eternal New Jerusalem. And now in this world, they're in exile. And that is where you are, where I am, where we are. We are in exile. That means this world is not our true home. 
It is not our native land. Exile is a metaphor of our present life in this world where we don't belong, where we are weird, we are swimming against the current, we're living under a different Lord. God is our Father. God, the Creator, is our Father. Jesus, the Lord, is our Savior and Lord and friend. And in the time of our exile, we should never forget that we belong to Him. There should be reverence. Now, let me bring this point down to, I hope, some very practical applications, okay? The big takeaway message from the Apostle Peter is the fear of God, this reverential awe of God, ought to and must characterize every moment of our existence as Christians. It must saturate and provide the atmosphere for everything we do. Everything. Now, let me give you some examples. In other words, Peter is not saying that reverence and awe are limited to Sunday morning worship. Now, we, we do come uh, with reverence and awe, and, and, and we're doing our best to, to, as humanly possible, to create that, that sense of reverence and awe by the way we conduct ourselves in worship. Right? We're coming to worship God. But, but it's more than just Sunday morning. Because Peter says, throughout the time of your exile, you know, Monday to Saturday, conduct yourselves in fear. Fear of the Lord, our God, our Father, the Judge, who is worthy of respect. So it's way more than how you feel on Sunday morning. You know, I, I get out of the car and I'm walking. Okay, man, i got to get real holy now. All right, <clears throat> what can I do? Get in a holy mood. No. No, 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 I should have been in that mood before I got here. <laughs> and in worship, we're just doing it together, you see. See that? It's more than just worship. It's more than mealtime prayers. You know, we pause, and we should. We're following Christ's example when we have a prayer before a meal. And sometimes, okay, now we're reverent today. Now it's reverence. And I'm going to go back to irreverence as soon as I get through eating or praying this prayer and I put my face in the pizza. I'm going to be very irreverent. You know, as if I just, I'm reverent when I'm praying. No, no, it's way more than just mealtime prayers. It's way more uh, than li weddings and funerals, you know. Uh, I want to give you an illustration of this that I find somewhat comical. There are some beautiful, absolutely beautiful places of worship in Huntsville, Alabama. I love looking at beautiful churches, and we are blessed to have some awesome churches. They are magnificent. I think of Nativity and, you know, First Methodist, the two Presbyterian churches down, right in the middle of downtown. Uh, I, think of, I think of Trinity Methodist and other churches that are just spectacular. And I would throw ours into the mix. You know what happens with churches like that? They get calls all the time from people wanting to have weddings and funerals there. Now, typically that call comes from a congregation that doesn't have a beautiful building. For whatever reason, maybe they're small and they can't afford it. Maybe they've built maybe a, a building that doesn't look like a church. But when people die or when they get married, they want something reverent. Isn't that something? And Peter is saying, oh, wait a minute, that's all well and good. But no, reverence is way more than just a wedding or a funeral. Weddings and funerals should be reverent, but so should every moment of my existence. And then we think about, you know, Easter and Christmas. Those are high and holy days. Well, in a sense, yes, but in another sense, no. Because we do the same thing on Christmas and Easter that we do Monday through Sunday of every week. So we live in the fear of the Lord. I want to give you a, a one-sentence bullet point application coming from a great Lutheran scholar by the name of R.C.H. Linsky. And Dr. Linsky says what Peter is saying is that we must as Christians daily combine holy fear with our earthly conduct. There you have it. Throughout the time of your exile means we conduct our whole lives in the fear of the Lord with reverence and with awe. And there are many, many ways that applies to us. And let me just give you broadly one application. 
this is something that is to be seen and noticed by the world at large. Reverence and awe in life. This fear of the Lord that Peter is commanding us to have it is not simply an internalized thing. It, it changes behavior. It changes the way we speak in public about God. How we speak about matters of eternity and salvation matters of ultimate importance it should be seen and heard it, it 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 affects the way we treat people because we know that our god has made them in his image and out of fear of the lord i treat my fellow human beings the way they should be as bearers of the image of god and it affects my business dealings as I represent my King and Lord who is the judge and the way you do your homework or don't do it. <laughs> and the way you take care of your body and the things you think about and the things you ingest mentally and physically. The fear of the Lord should affect everything about us. And so I would ask you right now, how is the Holy Spirit applying this to you? Is he speaking to has he has he illuminated some areas where there really isn't any evidence that you fear the Lord? But there needs to be visible evidence that I fear the Lord, that I'm walking in reverence and awe. In other words, that I'm not lost and awash in pop culture and things that don't matter. But there's a gravity, and the Bible calls it a sobriety about us. Not that we don't laugh, absolutely not. And not that we aren't joyful, but there's a weightiness about our lives. We know that eternity is coming. We know the judge is coming. And so we live as if we know we belong to a great God who is our judge. He's judged our sins on the cross. Hallelujah. And He will judge the world in righteousness by that same man that He raised from the dead who will come in glory. So how can you combine a holy, appropriate fear of God with all of your earthly conduct? That would be a great thing to ask the Spirit to teach you to do this week. How can you show the world that you fear God. I quickly want to come to what will lead us to the Lord's Supper, and that is the method and the motive for the fear of God, our fourth angle here. I want you to real quickly look at verses 18 and 19. Here is the, here is the, the answer to how and why. Here is the source and the substance of our fear. Knowing <laughs> knowing that you were ransomed. Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers. And you were not ransomed with perishable things like silver or gold, but you were ransomed with the precious blood of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was the Lamb without blemish. Now, I think what Peter is answering here is the question, how can I have this fear of the Lord and how can it be maintained in my life and I think the secret is in that little word translated knowing 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 that you were redeemed you were redeemed let me give you an illustration this week oddly enough I <laughs> I was researching in preparation for the sermon times in human history, or it, well I say human, times in, in American history, when a man or a woman on death row received a last moment clemency or pardon. And I read a bunch of stories of people, men who were strapped in the electric chair and, and, and the warden was just about to flip the switch. I've read stories of men that had the needle with the lethal chemicals ready to flow already in their arm when the call came. Can you imagine that? Now, put yourself there and just do a thought experiment with me. Let, let's say you are a convicted criminal. Capital offense. You've murdered 
and you did it and you deserve what you get and you were found guilty and you now have come to the time uh, when you've been led to the execution chamber you've had your last meal now you are, are strapped in you are, you are held down by manacles the IV is put in your arm and you know you're about to get exactly what you deserve And right before the countdown ends, three, two, one, the call comes not from the governor and not from the Supreme Court. It comes from the president himself. And he says, not only am I stopping your execution, I am pardoning you. And they're going to take that needle out of your arm and they're going to put those grave, rather those those clothes of incarceration that you wear, those, those jail clothes, and they're going to put a suit on you, and you're going to leave, and you're going to walk into a job making a six-figure salary, and you are going to climb to the highest echelons of society and be a man who is revered among men. That would change your life, right? Wouldn't that change your life? What would, what would you do if that happened to you? What would be the appropriate thing to do? It'd be to clean up your act. It would be to write a whole lot of thank you letters to that president. It'd be to go up there and see him and say, look, look, Mr. President, you do, you say what you want, I'll do anything you tell me to do. You have bestowed on me something that I could have never earned. I am, I am yours. That's a little bit like what Peter is saying, because that was us before we met Christ. We were going to get exactly what we deserved And yet, the execution was never carried out on us. It was carried out on Christ. And we were redeemed. We were forgiven. We were born again. We were adopted. We were justified. We are now being sanctified. One day we will be glorified. And all of that, my brothers and sisters, should literally drive us and compel us to live every moment for this great judge who took all of our depravity and laid it on the back of His Son and pronounced us not only forgiven, but righteous in His sight. Now that's how fear is developed. You remember, you know that you are redeemed. I'm going to keep talking and come down there. I'm going to give you one more illustration. Remember this woman that Jesus ran into, found in the Gospels, She was not a Jewish woman. She was a foreigner. And uh, she had a need for Jesus, a need for healing. And Christ walks by, and she reaches out. She calls out to Jesus. And he says some of the strangest things ever recorded in the Bible about are are the words of Jesus ever recorded in the New Testament. He, He says to her, woman, I didn't come for you. I didn't come for your tribe. I came for the house of Israel. And then she said with great boldness, Yes, Lord. But even the children sometimes get the crumbs that fall on the floor. Even the dogs, I mean, even the dogs, she said, are the children. Even the dogs will get crumbs that fall off the children's table. And then Jesus said, I've never seen such great faith. God does not owe us anything. He has not given us grace because He had to. Right? He did not have to save that woman, heal her child. He did not have to redeem her. And she's acknowledging that. And that drives a holy fear to know that the Lord owed me nothing and He gave me everything. (laughs) And now what can I do but be in awe that he would love me, a dog. He would love me. And now, I can't help but fear and revere him and stand in awe of his glory and his grace. This is the command of grace, to fear him because he loves you. And of course, we come to the Lord's supper table and we find the proof of that love, that undeserved love. The bread representing the broken body of the Son of God who was nailed to the cross in our place and the blood representing the death of the Son of God who died in our place. And as we share the Lord's Supper today, we want the fear of God 
the awe of His mercy to explode in our hearts. And that we would go home, or perhaps even before we get home, we would pray, Holy Spirit, take every fraction of my life and let it, let it function in fear of you. Reverence, awe. Let me glorify you in all we do because of what you've done for me. Father, we thank you for your word preached and read. And now the word we'll see in the Lord's Supper. And we thank you for the proof of your undeserved love. That you loved us first. That you gave Christ to us when we hated you. And you have redeemed us with power and mercy and with amazing grace that we could never fathom. And we ask that as we take the supper, we will see more of your glory and grace. That we will see more of the forgiveness we have in Christ, the standing we now have in Him, the freedom we have. And that our only response would be to give you everything we have and to conduct our days in this sin-stained, darkened world, in fear and in awe of you. And we ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. This online worship service is brought to you by Christ Presbyterian Church. Visit our sanctuary at 288 Old Highway 431 South in Hampton Cove, Alabama each Sunday morning at 1030, and you can join us in proclaiming Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. To learn more about Christ Presbyterian Church, visit us online at ChristPresHamptonCove.org.